people may wonder why is a doctor always calm because they have lot of patients your life is a mirror that reflects back to you what you have put out into the world make sure you are sending out what you want back listen to what that still small inner voice within you is saying just 5 minutes a day to get quiet and listen to yourself will get your day off to a good start the scope of ultrasound in emergency and critical care settings has been studied extensively it has higher sensitivity for detection and management of various respiratory problems under mechanical ventilation i invite dr shrikant shrinivasan to share his knowledge with us on lung ultrasound a monitoring tool in hypoxic patients he is consultant and head critical care medicine manipal uh, hospital new it's, delhi it's already done once uh, thank you for that uh, reintroduction and again another topic on ultrasound so uh, this is a different aspect how to deal with hypoxic patients uh, a lot of things which i'm going to say is obviously based on people who are actually doing this uh, practicing this modality because there's no way to simplify it or put it in in very very layman terms at this forum so it it, it requires some kind of background knowledge so if it go, sounds like leak and latin to a lot of people uh, really can't help that because it's a very specific topic regarding what are the findings right so i'll have to go with the fact that i believe a lot of people know a bit about lung ultrasound anyway so it's all based upon artifacts and its interpretation and which artifacts come in which area of the lung and how they progress over a period of time and the entire concept of lung ultrasound is based on that only because air produces artifacts aerated lungs produce a specific kind of artifacts deaerated lungs produce different kind of artifacts so step wise approach you can make out a lot of diagnosis so for for those who have an idea of what i'm talking about these are the four basic patterns which you see when you scan our lungs you see what's called a profile which is based predominantly these horizontal lines which 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 denote that this is an aerated section of the lung under my probe if there's associated with some kind of movement synchronous with breath we presume that this part of the lung is being aerated well ventilated receiving gas exchange on the other hand if you instead of these horizontal lines you see these vertical lines which become more closer and more denser we presume that the lung beneath the probe is getting more and more deaerated more congested because of inflammation because of injury because of flooding of alveoli uh, any of these causes can lead to production of this kind of profile which is called the b profile b1 if it is spread out these vertical lines b2 if they are close and if you have a totally solidified deaerated lung it's called a consolidation or a c profile so this is the basic spectrum of findings on lung ultrasound based on which we come across a lot of diagnosis and we follow it accordingly over a period of time and see how the patient is progressing or improving or worsening based on which profile is coming we all want this kind of profile because this is the normal aerated one if we come across any of this we do interventions and see how it progresses when we want to see or, or progress or follow up any disease we need to have a map regarding where this uh, pathology actually lies so we can divide the lungs into six areas two anterior two lateral two posterior the idea of this map is more for thoroughness to the fact that they are a good proportion of the lung as dr srinivas said lying posteriorly the dorsal portions which unfortunately receive the maximum amount of uh, perfusion because of the gravity based distribution but at the same time are prone to the most gravity based problems so any kind of effusion collapse increase weight of the lung because of congestion of lungs predominantly is the posterior part of the lungs which are going to get affected they're going to get deaerated then the profile is going to change into something else so uh, based on what findings we find we can describe this if you have this normal aeration pattern with sliding is called the a profile 
if we have something which looks like an aeration pattern but no movement whatsoever, it's called an A dash profile. This uh, denotes that there is still air, but this air may be outside your lungs, so in the form of a pneumothorax. So if you see this, finding on ultrasound, if it's a visual guide, you can just see this. You can very well say that this patient has a pneumothorax, possibly in this area. And the sensitivity for detecting a pneumothorax is very, very high for an ultrasound. On the other hand, if you have something like this, a lot of vertical lines with sliding, it's called a B profile, which says that the lungs are wet, getting congested. If you have the same things without much movement of this bright white line, we call it a B dash. It's more of an inflammatory kind of a condition. So if you want to differentiate between pulmonary edema because of fluid overload or because of LV failure, we'll get this kind of a pattern with this movement of this bright line and these bright things. And if we thinking more on the point of inflammation, ARDS, interstitial pneumonias, pulmonary fibrosis and so on, we're going to get this kind of a picture. Similar but lesser movement, restricted movement. And if you have a totally consolidated lung, we have what's called the C profile. So if you have a hypoxemic patient, there are three step approach to actually say this, what is the cause of hypoxemia with almost 91% accuracy by just seeing ultrasound images alone. The three steps is visualizing the movement. One is called sliding. Second stage, what is the profile, which I just spoke to you about, A, B, or C. And finally, in stage three, if you don't find anything anterior or laterally, you see posteriorly to see for collapse, effusion, consolidations, and all. So this is called the Blue Protocol, and this was devised predominantly for emergency physicians to, to bring about diagnosis, rapid diagnosis of acute hypoxemia. And these are the predominant findings in each of these profiles. But now, going forward, it's no longer just a diagnostic tool, it's become a respiratory monitoring tool. This is what we are looking at as the future of lung ultrasound. So it's not just for making diagnosis. Um, mind you, lung ultrasound does not make diagnosis, it just points out towards the deranged physiology. That there is aeration, normal, abnormal. There is de-aeration, what is the cause of de-aeration? That's what you need to find. And what is the stage at which the lungs are badly involved? This is, provides an immediate insight into what's going on inside your lungs. Much better than an x-ray definitely, sometimes equal to that of a CT scan. And findings on ultrasound are dynamic, which occurs much before your saturation will change or your blood gas will change or your parameters will change. It occurs much before that. It's immediate. So uh, how we do this is basically we can have semi-quantitative assessment of whatever I just spoke about. What is the amount of de we can, if we can attach a number to it, we can follow up a problem over a period of time. So a progressive change from one pattern to another pattern will be associated with progressive de -aeration. If I want to put it into a video, change from one pattern, predominantly horizontal, to more this, to more this, this is obviously progressively changing or worsening de -aeration pattern. And re is the opposite from here to here. It makes sense in that way. So this slide just tells you, if you have a normal pattern, you start changing into this, then into this, into totally into this. So this will just say that your aeration in the lung is getting affected by some means. So if you look at this point, this is also very important. It says that anything beyond this could actually mean normal or it could mean hyperinflation as well. Hyperinflation is something which Dr. Srinivas also spoke about. Certain, they are, no, most of our disease like ARDS is non-homogeneous. So certain alveoli are underventilated, certain alveoli are hyperventilated. Ultrasound, unfortunately, can definitely see underventilated or collapsed areas of lungs or de-aerated areas of lungs, but it really cannot catch hyperinflated areas of lungs. So this kind of a pattern with a progressive fall in the PF ratios can actually suggest that this hyperinflation going on. So you, you look at it from that sense. So this a uh, semi-objective figure which I was talking to you is what's called the ultrasound score based on what pattern we see in which part of the lungs. If you have a normal pattern which I said, that's given a specific score. As the pattern changes, the score becomes worse or better depending on we are looking at an aeration or a de-aeration pattern. Re-aeration pattern is when we are, score is when we are calculating when we are trying to do recruitment maneuvers. Like you said, should we do recruitment for all? No, but which patients to do recruitment? We can actually see with ultrasound whether this patient is actually recruitable or not, and then go ahead and do some maneuvers accordingly. 
So that can give one answer to what he was saying that not to do all, but to whom? That is the answer which you are trying to find. So if we see a change or a significant re by improvement in number or improvement of a change from one pattern to another, we say there is de aeration and longer, this recruitment has worked. When we are talking about weaning, the same kind of change from a normal to a consolidated pattern is given a score of uh, say one, three points is given from normal to B2 or B1 to C, five points if you skip from one stage to another, we give a number to that. And if you calculate this number in six zones on both the sides, so a total score which you get is, total areas is 12, total score is 36 and the worst pattern in both areas are calculated. So this is where it comes into play when we talk about mechanically ventilated patient, aeration and recruitment assessment. How to set PEEP, can it, can it provide a guide? To decide which is the optimal ventilatory strategy, whether proning will help this patient or this patient is more likely to benefit with higher PEEP strategy in a supine position itself. What are the complications with regard to mechanical ventilation and how do we help in weaning? So these are the things which we are focusing upon in the current day and age with lung ultrasound. So I'll take them one at a time. Re-aeration score can be used as a tool for recruitment. It has a good correlation with the CT uh, uh, induced or the pressure volume curve methods for assessing PEEP induced lung recruitment. If a score improves to more than equal to 18, we presume that more than eight, 600 ml of the lung volume has been recruited. But if the score is just around 14 to 18, there the, you know, the, the meaning becomes a bit more hazier. Number of papers which support that there's a good correlation with CT volumetric analysis of the same. This is just a representation of how it looks like a consolidated lung giving some amount of peep. You're seeing the opening up and then it is changing from one pattern from a solid pattern it is changed into a more of an aeration pattern. I know what I'm saying may not make a lot of sense to a lot of people, but I'm just going ahead with it anyway. So recruitment using peep. Uh, this we can actually see uh, to some extent. So uh, we can determine which is the opening pressure of a specific area of the lung. You place a probe, you give a recruitment, it changes from suppose a totally consolidated sudden aeration, air starts to enter from a C to a B2 to a B1 and to an A. That is the opening pressure of that area. You set the peep, they start reducing from there. Once you get to an area where it again starts to collapse, that's where you stop and set the peep two centimeter above that. So that makes sense in a way because it's a direct visual estimation of areas or regional lung ventilation. But as usual, some precautions have to be taken before every recruitment maneuver always assess hemodynamics because recruitment is sustained increase in intrathoracic pressure. And as the previous speakers have already told you, there's a very high incidence of uh, uh, acute corpulmonary in ARDS almost 30 to 50 percent. So you may have a acute rise and high intrathoracic pressure is never good for the right, heart, right side of the heart. So sudden increase in right heart pressures can occur because of your recruitment manuals and the patient may go into sudden hypotension. That could be because of right heart failure altogether. So that's something which you have to assess prior to recruitment and then you do a stepwise increase and see which is the best peep possible. But this is for patients who are otherwise have a congested lungs with gravity based distribution, makes sense there. But what about ARDS? As Dr. Srinivas already said, it's a non-homogeneous disease. There may be areas which are under recruited here, over distended here, it's non-homogeneous, it's not necessarily gravity based. So for non-gravity based, what to do? Should we go ahead and keep your probe at the most dependent areas and try to expand it and then see which is the best peep? The answer would be no, because it has been seen that the total consolidated area, the amount of pressure which is required to open it, will over distend your otherwise normal lungs and is going to cause barotrauma. It makes sense. It's a baby lung. Only some lung is involved. You may not be able to open up your totally consolidated area, but you may end up bursting your other areas, that is for sure. So you have to have a different kind of an approach for patients with ARDS. And as I said, the incidence of core permanent is high. And uh, so, this can be used as a tool for understanding which patients to give high peep or not. Or not. If you have a patient, sorry. Uh, if you have a patient in which you see that the 
aeration loss is gravity based more normal anteriorly more posteriorly here giving a lot of peep is going to cause over distension of the anterior areas right it makes sense so here a very high peep strategy may not really work what may actually work here is proning you turn the patient upside down the ventilation redistributes to this area this area tends to open up right patients who have a total diffuse pattern both anteriorly posteriorly their high peep strategy may be actually useful and these patients may actually benefit from peep of say more than 12 16 20 20 here giving very high amount of peep is only going to end up expanding the anterolateral area and there probably it's not a very good candidate for a high peep strategy neither for a recruitment strategy so here a proning would be a very good idea for these kind of patients a high peep relatively supine position may work sufficiently well for this and this is what i had just mentioned in a nutshell and this is the study which sort of just showed you ki which strategy to be chosen and which patient to be prone in the first place okay the point written in red is what makes significant as i told you in the start a normal aeration pattern could be normal lungs could mean hyperinflated lungs so if you have a worsening of pf ratio with an improvement in your lung aeration scores it is going in two opposite directions right your reaeration is occurring apparently as per you but your pf ratios are going down so what it suggests is basically over distension is occurring it's not actually reaeration is over distension so there this can actually give you an idea that this is indirectly over distension which is going on and you actually reduce the amount of peep reduce your pressures how to guide prone position within 3 hours if you turn the patient prone some patients you see that you've turned them prone initially they may respond well uh, transiently and then after some time there is no improvement at all on the other hand some patients are late openers they they improve over a period of time so which patients to persist with proning and with patients to decide that probably proning may not really help so they have seen the scores reaeration scores within 0 hours and 3 hours and they have seen that the maximum benefit occurs within 3 hours actually at least with respect to lung ultrasound reaeration scores 12 hours 16 hours proning i can understand but which are those patients who are going to actually benefit from those 12 16 hour proning are those who have a maximum change in reaeration within the first 3 hours after that the rate of change becomes much lesser this is as per a study which is there and they have the best outcome in 7 days mortality and the best chance of pf ratios more than 300 those who have a change in the scores within the first 3 hours of more than 5.5 ventilator related complication again i'm showing the same thing if you see this pattern anywhere in your scanning this is a pneumothorax and once you see it you know that your enthusiastic recruitment maneuvers have not helped if you see this over a period of time in your ultrasound these are signs of consolidation put it to memory you can see a total solidified lungs you can see something called a shred you can see what's called a dynamic air bronchogram so you can see a solid lung with air streaks entering and going this is classical consolidation doesn't occur in atelectasis and it can differentiate between consolidation and atelectasis based on ultrasound atelectasis on the other hand will look like this just one small solidified area of lung no dynamic air coming in or going large amount of effusion there is volume loss so the diaphragm that side is pushed up further coming to the last aspect weaning how to go about weaning a lots of causes of failure in weaning one of the major causes being non optimization of patient prior to weaning just because your primary disease has come to an end you have decided the patient should be weaned that is not the only aspect you have to make sure the patient is deresuscitated or the fluid which you have given so much has come out the heart function especially for patients with diastolic dysfunction so those patients you have to deresuscitate aggressively prior to getting them off extra amount of fluid around the lungs should be removed prior to getting them off you have to give them the best chance to get them off and finally the diaphragm plays a very major role in delayed failure of weaning i'll talk in brief about all of them so the role comes before during and after a spontaneous breathing trial right draining pleural effusions especially when large makes a lot of sense because 
you, it's just there and you leave it. Patient is weakened over a period of time on a ventilator. So you need to give him the best effort. So the least amount of hindrances to your breathing should be there. So draining effusions always helps. Patients with diastolic dysfunction, as I said, you have to de-resuscitate. And one of the most common cause of early failure after extubation is because of inability of the heart to cope up with the load of spontaneous breathing. Such patients are the ones who are going to benefit from some amount of CPAP or BiPAP post extubation also. So they are the ones, you do a spontaneous breathing trial, you see a difference in the aeration or de-aeration scores once the spontaneous breathing trial is done. Yeah, yeah, I'm done. So uh, this is what I was saying. If at the end of a spontaneous breathing trial, if the score is less than 13, very good chance of success of extubation. If it is more than 17, irrespective of whether your clinical parameters are met and your RSBI and everything is perfect and everything is good, the patient might will most likely fail extubation. So this gives you a perspective of which patients to select for CPAP or BiPAP or some kind of positive pressure to keep the alveoli recruited in the post extubation phase also. Nothing can be over without a diaphragmatic ultrasound because that is also a major aspect of your thing and diaphragm is predominantly taken into consideration when we talk about weaning. Uh, diaphragm like any other muscle undergoes atrophy, critical illness, myoneuropathy affects the diaphragm also. 70% of the respiratory work is done by the diaphragm. Two ways of looking at the diaphragm, one is the excursion, other one is the thickening. Diaphragm like biceps will contract and thicken during inspiration, will thin out during exhalation. So if you can make out the thickness of the diaphragm during inspiration and subtract it from exhalation and make, get a ratio, if it is more than 30%, it says that there's a diaphragmatic strength is preserved. If it is less than say 20%, there's a very high chance that there's diaphragmatic weakness and this patient will end up in a failure, maybe not immediately, but after four or five days or so, will fatigue and fail out. So certain, you have to be pre-warned and uh, be more cautious in those, in those subset of patients. This is, so this is in a nutshell about the weaning process with ultrasound. Assess aeration scores, remove effusions. Uh, below the diaphragm, assess for ascites, any other cause of tense or distended abdomen. Assess the cardiac status, assess the diaphragmatic status. In fact, it's going forward to see when assess extra diaphragmatic muscles as well. And that will optimize the patient for your weaning. So thank you and I apologize to people who do not understand anything of what I said. When it comes. Any questions? I doubt. Thank you, Shrikant, sir. Thank you. Thank you. On lighter note.